Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar, a panel discussion on the critically acclaimed film Nasreen. My name is Zainab Khan, and I am the executive director of MALA, the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. We are a national 501c3 that focuses on empowering Muslim American voices, as well as cultivating leadership through our stories, through our programs. Mm -hmm. Now, just as kind of a background, Mala was started as a storytelling platform, and we've utilized digital media as a very powerful tool to share stories and also to dispel stereotypes, to um, fight for human rights and for advocacy for women and children across the world. We started with our first partnership, with, which was with Participant Media and we had shown the nationwide films of He Named Me Malala, which we also screened at the United Nations General Assembly with over 1800 youth. So hence, going back to that, since our inception, the concept of storytelling, digital media, and human rights has always been a passion for Mala. And tonight I am so thrilled to announce that we have the film's producer and director, Marsha Ross joining us. We have award-winning journalist and human rights advocate, Adele Nazarian, and this evening's conversation will be moderated by our very own Iranian-American community leader, Nariman Safavi. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Nariman, I will hand over the mic to you um, because there's a lot to talk about within this hour. So thank you once again to everybody for joining us this evening. Absolutely, and thank you. Uh, oh, thank you all for coming and taking the time to uh, watch this uh, very important movie. Uh, and thank you, Zainab, for organizing all of this. And thank you, Malo and Malo Board for championing this cause. Uh, and uh, I want to basically uh, say that uh, as a, I look at this more as a sort of a, from a cultural perspective, uh, 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 and it's a film that's really a fantastic film capturing one of the most important Iranian personalities around an activist on the ground, uh, championing one of the most important issues in Iran, women's rights and human rights and children's rights and, uh, and so many other things that are critical to the ultimate democratization of the Iranian society. Uh, so anyways, and I want to thank also uh, Adal Nazarian and Marsha Ross for doing this and coming over here. And I hand it over to you, Adal, to introduce yourself. Thank you so, so much. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be on with such distinguished, amazing individuals, all of you. And it's so uh, reassuring because while individually we've all done so many things in our own way collectively it's so much more powerful and uh, my, my background um, just so I can introduce myself is I was a journalist for 10 years and I have um, always been very interested in and my heart has been uh, devoted to the human rights uh, struggle internationally and um, there's just something so beautiful and impactful of course of having the opportunity to deliver stories to the masses, but it's an added something so different when you're actually there in front of the individuals who these stories are being told about um, to actually live and experience in in what in a, a capacity what they've gone through. And I, you know, I'm first generation Iranian American, born in America. My parents left Iran at um, the ages of 12 and 15. So it's interesting to see how they, while they still ident they're Americans, of course, but they still identify so heavily and beautifully with their Persian culture and heritage. And so for me, growing up and kind of seeing the balance um, between being, you know, an American, but my culture, which I'm so proud of, um, it's been it's been really, especially at watching um, Nasreen's story. I mean, I feel I feel what what she's going through. I feel what so many women, um, including you know my own parents, for example, my father and mother, of course, but had to go through to leave behind their country of origin and to come here because it was no longer a safe place. And for Nasreen um, to be doing this and to being a hero and a leader 
suffering through all of this for the sake of women in Iran and throughout the whole world is so selfless. And so I'm committed to doing my part to continuing to hopefully be a pioneer and, and, a, and, a, and a leader and a warrior in a sense for women's women's rights um, throughout the whole world. And um, just very proud that I can be here in America and with all of you amazing human beings to continue this effort forward. Thank you. I'm gonna mute myself now. <laughs> and Marsha, why don't you uh, uh, let us know a little bit about what's going on here and tell us a little bit also about the genesis of how this idea came about. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, you know, Nari and Adele and Zanab for, for having me on your show and on behalf of myself and my producing partner and he's also the director and writer of this film, Jeff Kaufman. We're really so happy for this opportunity to talk with you about Nazreen and the making of the film. I'll just begin by saying that I, um, I had a long career as a casting director for film and television. I was an executive at the Walt Disney Company for 16 years. I was an executive at Warner Brothers. I've had my own business and have worked on many, many narrative films, but I've always had a great interest in, in both, not just human rights, but I think in individuals who, who really um, make a difference in the world on behalf of other people and who have great purpose in their lives. Uh, that leads them to do to do things and to do things you know above and beyond what you know I might do or what the average person does and I think Nazreen is is such a role model for that and she's been a great inspiration to me and we 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 um, Jeff Jeff had made several other films about about Iran in the past um, and he'd done several films for Amnesty International including one called Education Under Fire about the persecution of the Baha'i faith in Iran. And um, at that time, he came across Nazarene because in her work in his, as an attorney, she represents this underserved community, you know, people that won't, you know, she takes on cases that others will not take on, LGBT, children's rights, of course, women's rights, and uh, the Baha'i. And at that time, he was really interested in the idea that this Muslim woman was helping at great risk to herself, you know, her Baha'i clients and friends. So we were finishing our last film about American playwright Terrence McNally, it's Every Act of Life, um, and it's about Broadway theater and also about another courageous human being who made a lot of changes in, in the culture at risk to himself. And we started talking about Nazreen and she was becoming more and more in the news, although internationally, she wasn't that well known here. And once I learned about her, it, it really became important for me personally to tell the story because you know, one of the things you learn is, you know, history is often rewritten by men or the women, women's history is just sort of put aside. And, and Nazreen is such a, an important figure in Iran now. And I think for all history, she will be. And we wanted to make sure that she, we were able to capture her life in her own words. So in 2016, we were introduced to her and we spoke with her and her husband Reza about whether or not they would be interested in, in pursuing a documentary about her and them actually. And she was very clear. She said she didn't want this just to be about herself. She wanted to be about the people that she represented and all the other human rights, def human rights defenders you know, that are part of her circle of people. It couldn't just be about her. And that was important because we're really interested also in community. And we were also very careful because we were really worried about her safety, obviously making the film. No, we didn't want anything to happen to her while we made the film. And we asked her many, many times during the making of the film, whether or not, are you sure, should we continue? Even when we finished the film, before it was shown to anybody, we asked again, and she was absolutely wanted the film told. And she was actually, and for those of you who've seen the film, she was also arrested uh, while we were making the film, not because of the film, but during, in 2018, she was arrested for her work with the Girls of Revolution Street. So um, we, Jeff and I could not go to Iran, Jeff's previous work in Iran. And also, frankly, as two American, you know, filmmakers on the ground there, we would have been very conspicuous. And we had some very brave cinematographers who were able to follow her around for a couple of years, really intimately. And that was how we were able to really get an inside look at, at both her work, but also her personal life and her relationships and her family, her marriage, um, and all the things that are really important to her. Wonderful. And, uh, and uh, was there initially any reluctance or any resistance on her part 
uh, to submit herself to such a documentary making, because I, I know she likes to be very quietly effective at times, and uh, she doesn't necessarily garner publicity. There are a lot of shrill champions of human rights for Iran, uh, but they're not really that effective. Uh, but uh, she is, she seems to be a very quietly effective person. So uh, how did you convince her to do this? Well, I think the idea that um, it would be a community portrait, uh, not just about her personally, but about, you know, all of the, the people that she worked with and the other women, because, you know, the women's rights movement and the feminist movement in Iran is very strong. I mean, I, I don't think people quite realize it's one of the strongest and most active, you know, in the world. The women of Iran are a very, as a group, extraordinarily brave and admirable people. I mean, honestly, with the repression that they experience, what they're willing to do um, to, for their rights is amazing. And she wanted the film to be about that. And so she was really open to it. You know, I, no, I, and I'll tell you something also really interesting. You know, when we started the film, of course, so that's what she was okay about. But when we started the film, she hadn't started with this, you know, the Girls of Revolution Street movement. And then of course she was took on these cases of defending these young women who were taking their headscarves off in public to, to, to uh, protest the mandatory regime law and that she was arrested. And, and what I realized while we're editing the film is that she really knew, she, I think she'd been arrested before. I think she pretty much knew she could get arrested again. The kind of work that she did was always susceptible to possibly being arrested. And I think it became an opportunity for her to get out what she really wanted the world to know before she was silenced. Or if she was silenced. Well, wow, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, she is uh, yeah, definitely, uh, it, it worked. And I think it all has come out in a very timely manner. And now it's, it, this is a really amazing moment to shift the discourse on your own and take it towards the issues of uh, uh, human rights. Uh, Adele, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think about uh, the, uh, the movement of Iranian movement uh, uh, for taking the hijab off and larger Iranian movement? How is that affecting the female activists of Iranian diaspora like yourself? Thank you. So I think that it's so much easier, of course, for us to be here in America and to watch and to see and witness what these women are going through in Iran. I mean, I can tell you that if I was born in Iran and if I lived in Iran, I would probably be in prison. I can, I can say that without a, a shred of doubt in my mind because um, I have a voice and I'm go going to use it. And so many Iranian women, of course, are among the strongest, <laughs> some, of the, some of the strongest women, I guess, collectively that, I, that I've seen. And I have to say, them going into this, each and every single one of them who have made the news, who have unfortunately lost their lives, who continue to go on these White Wednesdays, for example, and remove their hijabs, and who continue to go to the streets and put their lives at risk, they know what they're getting into. They absolutely realize the risks that go along with these actions. And, but they know also that the, the alternative is essentially like being in, in bondage and living a life like in, in, a, in a prison essentially. So they're basically choosing which prison they want. The prison of um, emotional and, and submission being relegated to second-class citizens in society or to actually take the risk of being locked up behind those cold metal bars and potentially having the opportunity to set, to set, you know, to set other women free. Um, so I think that the way that it, it affects women here in, in America is that I'm noticing a lot more women are getting wind of what's happening. A lot more people are becoming more engaged and interested thanks to the tremendous work, amazing work of, by Marsha and Jeff to help raise awareness through the medium of Hollywood, of, of telling storytelling. It's reaching so many more people. And um, I know that it may not seem like much, but believe it or not, every single voice matters. And we've seen even this reaches up to the legislative level, to the to the government level, where um, because of work, because of Marsha and Jeff's work, you know, it's it's gotten people and members of government, and because of the voice of the masses, to to stand up and actually start paying more attention. And 
it just shows that hope is not lost. And the, the more these women in Iran continue to, to rise up and to get out there and to unfortunately put themselves at risk, um, the less likely it is, believe it or not, that the government will be able to, to come down on them as hard because it's getting more attention. And the more we can shine a light on it, the less likely it is that the backlash um, will be violent. And uh, I guess, as I said earlier, collectively we're stronger than, than individually. So I hope to see this continue. Well, the Iranian government talks a tough game about these things. And initially they show some severe reaction. But as uh, we witnessed a few months ago with the executions uh, of uh, political prisoners, uh, when it started to, the numbers started to go out, there was a huge wave of protest and media activism and social media. And actually the executions stopped for a while. So, and we know that also when the women were going around and taking their hijabs off, yes, many of those people, uh, women got arrested and some of them got represented by Nasrina Sutude's firm uh, ultimately, but then they quietly, you can see that some of the hijab restrictions are getting loosened up. Even the media products, Iranian national television, uh, the actresses who are acting there, their hijabs are very, very sort of, uh, they're kind of there, kind of not there. So, so, so it's really weird to see that they don't want to be perceived as immediately making a concession. But ultimately, this kind of uh, uh, outcry, public outcry and media pressure, they, they make concessions to ultimately. Uh, and we just got to keep it up. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and anyway, so go ahead, go ahead. Can, can I show something? It was, it was interesting. Sure. So, I mean, I, I personally, if I'm going into a religious place, of course, I'm going to I'm going to respect the religious. You know what I mean? Right. right. A masjid, the or traditions a, or whatever. Yes. A yes. Mandir or a temple, whatever it is. But it's funny because right. I noticed in the film, there was one part where you think the hijab, it has to be like this. Right? I'm going to show you an example. It's like covering yeah. everything. Right. <laughs> Chodor, right? Then, yeah, exactly. In the film, there was women who were putting their hair like this. Right. And they're actually showing more of their hair. So it's exactly what you're saying. It's like little by little, it's like the, you know, the head covering, the, the headscarf comes down and it's almost as if they want to, the government will like allow them to like show their hair. But then if they're willing to like, if they talk and they raise their voice, then they're targeted. So as you said, baby steps, hopefully leaps forward, but we want to get it to the point where women don't have to cover their hair anymore. They can have the choice to do that, like it was under the Shah. Um, and and not, not saying, by the way, that, you know, saying I, I condemn or condone any political leader, I'm just saying during the time of the Shah, there was a lot more freedom for women and hopefully get to the point where they can actually also use their tongues and their voices. So, so <laughs> I, I agree with you. Absolutely. With Nazreen, I think you touched upon, well, you touched upon two things. I must say, Adele, you said something uh, that we've never really brought up in, in any of the talks. The first one is there's a scene in the film after she gets out of prison and she goes to this poetry reading and she gets up and everybody is applauding her. And she talks about the big prison and the little prison. And, uh, you know, the first time I heard yeah. it, it took a minute for me to understand. And then I thought, oh, I know what she's talking about. You know, out here is the big prison. Avin is the little prison, you know, that, that you right. live in the prison. But the thing that, you know, is so important about what Nazreen says in the film is, is this idea that, you know, this little piece of cloth, you know, it's not whether or not we can, you know, take it off. It's we want the choice. Because if they tell us that we don't have to wear it, then they're still deciding for us. We want to have the right to decide if we want to wear it, we wear it. And if we don't want to wear it, we don't wear it. Because we want the freedom of thought. You know, we want the freedom of our own actions. And that, that's, that's really what she's going for. You know, that the freedom to think as you wish and do as you wish and not have a, a government or a lot of men actually, you know, control, you know, your entire life. What's the I, I agree with that too. And I kind of have to jump into this because after, you sure. know, having collected thousands of stories from diaspora groups, Muslim Americans, primarily, I was talking earlier about 25% of our oral histories come from people of Iranian descent. And 
I, I must say myself, my mother was Pakistani. My father was Afghan from Afghanistan. And, you know, if they didn't make that, if my father didn't make that decision to come here, my life would have been very, very, very different. And the bedrock of democracy in our society is freedom of speech freedom of speech, freedom of thought. And yes, we have a long way to go when it comes to women's rights, equality, equal pay, shattering the glass ceiling and whatnot, women on boards. However, we must use our privilege to be able to share these stories. You know, even showing this film in Iran, in certain regions of, of the Middle East, I know for a fact is like, that's a red flag. You cannot do that. And to have an open conversation like this, where there's, yes, there may be differences of opinion in certain things, but we can all come together and say, women must not be controlled by any regime or law or government on how they dress, what they can be, what they should not, and even what they can professionally achieve. So given that, that's also a theme that's come up quite a bit in our oral histories. And that's something that I think is very important for generations to come so they can look at it as an educational repository and be like, this is what it was like for somebody who was of this generation that lived in Iran and came to the United States and went through this, this, and this. So, you know, again, I, I always say we're, we're living in a country where, where, the, where it's the best country to be an immigrant. It's the best country to be a Muslim. It's the best country to be a woman because we still have these rights. Absolutely. And uh, what's really commendable about Nasreen's work, uh, observing it from outside, is that uh, she's not just focused on hijab and, uh, and, and, uh, and the familiar issues about women, but she is also very good has been very good at being a consultant to, uh, to uh, members of the parliament in Iran who are more open-minded uh, and actually focusing on issues such as, uh, you know, issues of polygamy, issues of uh, children's, uh, children's custody and divorce for women. There have been, uh, there has been incremental progress made at times when you have a little more pragmatic or a more reformist parliament in Iran, that she actually is, uh, she works with those people very closely. And she's not just standing outside and shouting uh, truth to power, but she's working, she has an inside game and an outside game. <laughs> and, it's, and that's a very commendable approach. Uh, at the same time, she is, uh, she is uh, through her law firm and through a partnership that she had with Shirin Ebadi, who, who won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, several years ago. Uh, they, they, are, uh, they are a formidable force for the Iranian government. And there are actually people who believe that in the upcoming presidential elections coming this summer, she ought to declare a candidate, uh, her, herself as a candidate for the presidency of the Islamic Republic and force the regime to pay the political cost of disqualifying her. I don't know if she's going to listen to that, but I know she has gotten that advice. <laughs> well, um, if, if I may add, I think that would be tremendous for her to do that. I really, really do. And I think so too. The thing is though, that she would at that point, um, most likely putting her life at really big risk. And again, she's done so much so far. May God protect her and bless her. Um, but I see her as you do, as a fighter of that nature, 100%. And I just want to add something else, if I may. Um, her husband, Reza, you know, we, we talk about women's rights and it's Women's History Month and all that stuff. And it's amazing. Um, you know, she was able to also do what she did because of the amazing support of her incredible loving husband. And it's so, so, look, women are, can stand on their own, of course. Women were strong, we're independent, we're the bearers of life, all that stuff. But we need to have the support of our male counterparts. And in so many cases, it makes the difference between success and failure with that. So I also have to commend Nasreen's husband, Reza, for being such an amazing, amazing um, husband and significant other to her. And he's a, he's a role model also for so many men who know oh. and are married to strong women like us, you know? 
Well, they're a very, they're a very interesting couple. Uh, they're almost <laughs> like a power couple yeah. in Iran in the sense that uh, their activism is truly a, a partnership for them. And, uh, and, I, and I really commend Marsha uh, for her and her work for capturing some of that. They're really a couple that are really at work together. And, it's, uh, and he is really a very, very interesting Iranian man that is willing to share the limelight with his uh, wife. And you know, behind every great woman, there is, there is a really a great man also standing. And also in public, they're usually a very uh, interesting uh, in, in terms of that they are willing to express affection to each other. Uh, publicly, they hold hands. They've even kissed in public in front of the media. So they're really just subtly shifting the culture of what it means to be a couple for Iranian people. And, and it's really great that Marsha's film captures a little bit of that. Absolutely. Can I just say, you know, my nickname for Reza is, you know, Marty Ginsburg. The husband of Martin Ginsburg, because you yeah. know, like like Martin Ginsburg, you know, he, he's a very accomplished man in his own. He's a graphic artist. He's also an activist himself, and very accomplished man, and yet extremely comfortable, you know, sharing, you know, like, like giving his wife the limelight, sharing in this with her, supporting her, being her partner in these things, and and he's a wonderful father as well. And also, we thought, you know. It's important for people to see that there are Muslim men, there are men in Iran, you know, who are modern and progressive. It's, it's, you know, we can't just deal with all the stereotypes because there are a lot of stereotypes, which also lends me to say something else that were very important for us in the film that, you know, you all on the, you know, those of us on the call today, you know, you obviously know a great deal about Iran, but, you know, many Americans know nothing about, you know, most Americans that I know, particularly people who are not Iranian Americans, they know nothing about Iran. What do they really know? You know, if they read the news, they, they read about what's going on in the government, you know, Iran nuclear deal, the Ayatollah, this thing that, you know, the Iran hostage crisis, you know, that's maybe the last thing most people know about Jimmy Carter, 1979, that's a long time ago. So, um, and they don't really know anything about the culture and they don't know anything about the people. And we really wanted to capture that. I mean, Iran is a really beautiful country. And I think that makes it even more emotionally tragic that people can never go back to this country that they, they, they love. But also we really wanted to show the sort of the common humanity that we all share. You know, people are people. You know, when you get past the governments and all the noise and the saber you know, rattling and all that stuff that goes on, we're all people with the same hopes and dreams. We want the same things. You know, one of my favorite, favorite moments in the film is when Nazreen is picking her son up from school, you know, and he has his little backpack, you know, and they're holding hands. And that's a very universal image for women around the world picking their children up for school. I mean, this really powerful, brilliant strategic lawyer who walks her son home from school, just like mothers do everywhere. And I, and I, I think that was very, that was really important for us to, 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 to really humanize the situation. Yes, thank you for doing that. That, that, that. Those are wonderful moments that you're pointing to and extremely humanizing uh, of Iranians. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, ask Zainab, uh, what do you, uh, it's really, uh, what do you think a um, role Mala could play in propagating this besides holding events like this? I really want to see uh, more of a, you know, cultural component to, uh, you know, uh, of Iranian women and women across the Middle East. I really think this is a moment when we need to shift the conversation, not just on Iran, but also a lot of other Middle Eastern and Muslim countries and start to look at this from the perspective of women first, mm -hmm. before we get into the geopolitics, before we get into religion, we get, I think the, you know, the moral judgment that can be made about every society is how it treats it, its women. That's a universal standard for me about how I judge a society. And we need to start to focus that on that as American Muslims and try to create a different lens for people to view us through. So, so important. And I think that so first of all, what I want to say is there is actually Nasreen, um, 
one of her uh, one of her favorite um, images is one of Mohandas Gandhi, where it says the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. So Nariman, right. that goes back into what you were saying. Right. Uh, Marsha, going back into humanizing people, this is essentially why Mala was started as a non-political, non-theological organization that can capture the stories of Muslim Americans, whether they're first generation, fourth generation, converts, reverts, orthodox, to secular, to atheists, whatever it may be, it's your heritage. We've done many events with Jewish organizations, with Christian organizations of, you know, Muslim Jewish, her people of Muslim Jewish heritage, Muslim Christian heritage, mixed heritage. And that's really what sets us apart. Now, going into that, that doesn't mean everything is all, you know, flowers and roses. We've gotten, we've gotten negativity because we've served wine and, you know, talked about the history of Shiraz wine uh, in Chicago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But that's, that's the beauty of Iran. And, and what we would like to do and what we have always continued to do is to empower people through their own stories, give them autonomy to share their stories. You can check us out at malanational.org. And all of the stories that are collected are also archived into the National Library of Congress. So we are the only organization that has completely documented and historically archived these stories from people of all, all over the United States that identify of Muslim heritage. They can be Orthodox, they can be secular, whatever it may be but it's their stories. And through these stories, we've come across incredible, incredible people. And this is what, why we host these events. Um, for me, when I saw Nasreen's story, it reminded me, there were so many parallels where I thought of Malala Yousafzai, where I thought of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where I thought of actually even some of my own family members. I thought of myself and what I would be in and, and what role and what capacity would I be in if I was in a different country, if I was in a country that was, um, you know, patriarchal and misogynistic, where I couldn't be a physician because I'm a woman, or I can't be a judge because I'm a woman by law. So this is essentially what we hope to do is to continue humanizing and essentially be a civic organization that can put pressure on the government and keep showing that these types of stories, um, if we can put international pressure, then we can create some sort of change. Um, and that's really what the goal is, you know, with Mala. Uh, I want to ask, also ask a question from Marsha. Uh, what do you think uh, could be more done with this movie? Uh, one thing that comes to my mind is to arrange for screenings for members of Congress. Uh, I mean, it's one thing just to approach for the uh, Biden administration, but another that some of the policymakers, but also I think that members of Congress, and now we have some Muslim members of Congress, some of them are women, and we can ask them to organize a screening and invite other members of Congress to come and see this and maybe with a panel with you, Marsha, and some Muslim women, to further explain maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, the two other women who are here, the three of you could actually do something sort of a screening in Congress or in uh, before the senators. Uh, and, uh, and, and they do do that. Usually they have it on Friday nights. Uh, so, uh, and that's, uh, that would be an excellent thing to do for all, for all of us to go and try to search in our contacts and see if we can kind of lever this in to the agenda of having screenings for Congress. Well, that, that's something we're, we are working on, you know, for the spring coming up in the next few months. You know, we're continuing our impact campaign, you know, uh, into the summer. And, and you, know, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of negotiations right now, as you probably know. So it's a little right. at the moment, but that is definitely on our agenda. You know, the film, we, we have brought the film to the European Parliament. Um, we've read statements there, and they've issued uh, decrees on behalf of Nazreen. We've Fantastic. The bar associations, the internet. We had lawyers from all around the world who have issued decrees. The German judges. The, we were involved with the Right Livelihood Award, the American Bar Association. So we have done a lot of events and impact events that um, 
are continuing to make you know people aware of this and have made people say things and write things and do things. And we have these petitions, by the way, on our website, nazarenefilm.com. There's a no ruse petition through Amnesty. We've also for many, many months been working with Penn America and International because they've been very active on behalf of Nazareth. And I hope people will visit our website and you know, we send out updates every month about what's going on with Nazarene and the film. And, and the film has also been actually been seen in Iran, Zanab. Uh, you know, BBC Persia and Iran Wire have shown it there. Oh. Uh, in, yeah, in November. And yeah, they, that's how I saw it, actually, yes. Yeah, and, then, and, and now it's available around the world because um, we also, you know, have, we have an international distributor. It's, you know, it, it's available. You can find that on the website and also in April, um, the, on iTunes in all, like 52 other countries, some of these countries you were talking about, the film will actually be available there too. So oh, really Marjorie, we would, Mala would be honored to host this in Congress. Adele, yeah. you, you know, bringing this, this entire <laughs> dynamics back into, into Washington, DC. I think that would be very, very powerful. We definitely, I, we de this is something we so want to do. We've done a number of some events with the UN in, in conjunction with International Women's Day. So, you know, we're trying to do all these things. You know, we want to do all these things. I mean, the goal of the film is impact. You know, we wanted to make an impact. May I, may I also add, by the way, that's the impact is, I mean, we're forever grateful to you and it's only just beginning. I'm, I know it and we're gonna make tons of progress. I just want to add something also, um, Mr. Nariman, how you asked about, you know, how Muslim women, right, um, can this message and having more Muslims involved. It, it's really amazing because the, the Iranian regime, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and I'm sure Marsha and everyone here can attest to that, does not represent the Iranian people. It does not represent the Muslim people. And oftentimes we see so many groups that like to claim the mantle of speaking on behalf of Muslims everywhere and they don't do it actually. <laughs> and that's why I'm so grateful to organizations like Mala who actually do represent a truly free and open, um, you know, for, and, and all, all encompassing for, for all Muslims from all walks of life. So um, just wanted to, you know, add that on that the Iranian regime is, and everyone knows it here, is very separate from the Iranian people. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, my, my husband himself is from Tehran and he is, you know, he is not thrilled by ever like going back or visiting. Um, however, you know, for me as a Muslim, self-identify, I identify very strongly as a Muslim woman. I'm very proud of my heritage, my culture, and my religion. However, what we see in the media, what we see in regimes, what we see even through some elected officials, they're not representative of Muslims across the United States who are in fact the most diverse demographic group in this country so that's essentially why i you know come back to that 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 main point with nasreen's film is human rights right what is that what is that main common denominator that across the board wh whatever side of the aisle you're on politically whatever it may be what can we stand together for and that's what i think the film has a very powerful message um, and then essentially, you know, that's where I watched it the first time I watched it the second time. And then I'm like, wow, this is, this is Oscar worthy. This is, I, I hope you were, were you nominated for the Oscars, Marsha? We, we, um, we definitely qualified. So, you know, we submitted, you know, it's a very, very expensive proposition to, you know, <laughs> Film. I mean, you know, if you, you know, the studios are able to pour, I mean, you know, so much money into their campaigns. But one of the things we had this fantastic song um, at the end of the film written uh, by uh, uh, Lynn Aarons and Stephen Flaherty, who wrote the music for Ragtime and um, Once on This Island and a number of other Broadway shows. We, we got to know them when we were making Every Act of Life because they, they'd written several shows for, with Terrence, who was the book writer. And we sent them uh, Nazarene's letters to her children from prison because uh, you know there's so many things when you make a documentary. The film's 92 minutes long; you can't have everything in it. And she, you know, we did a little bit because you know you have Olivia Coleman at the beginning reading one of the letters. But 
you know, Jeff thought, what can we do with the letters? Perhaps there's some more to it. And, we, you know, he sent it to them and they were really inspired by them. And we, we were able to do a pretty significant uh, campaign on behalf of the song. And the song got a lot, a lot of attention and for the film and for Nazreen. So that, that was good. It's just the, the economics of it. But we were thrilled just to sort of be like in the list of films that were considered and, you know, get in the Academy screening room. Oh. That's that's wonderful, and it was also very heartwarming to see other people like Olivia Coleman are actually sympathetic to the cause too. And and there there is definitely ways we can help uh, propagate this message that way too. Maybe uh, at some point have uh, Olivia <laughs> be, be also one of these uh, streaming events, and she could she could uh, definitely draw her own audience to all of this too. Uh, so uh, anyway, but uh, what. Uh, what do we are we going to take questions now from the crowd or have that uh what what's our timetable for that i see that there's some questions popped up so i believe there's one that came mm -hmm. up um yeah. what keeps nasreen focused and gives her the strength to continue her fight for civil rights human rights and women's rights i think marcia you you could definitely you know share that with us because that's also something that i'd love to that's the question in my mind too. Well, you know, that was my, in my mind too, particularly as a mother myself, you know, how do you, you know, when you know what you're doing may take you from your children. I think there's a few things. I mean, one uh, and more important, I mean, she, she absolutely believes it's the right thing to do. It is her, it's a purpose, you know, she's driven by her purpose and her purpose is to make a difference in the lives of her children and women and, and, and future generations in Iran. And I think that is very central to, to what's driving her. It's not, it's not politics that's driving her. It's driving, it's, what's driving her is trying herself to make a difference for future generations and freedoms that she believes in. So that's, that's, that's for sure, I think, what keeps her going. Um, and she's incredibly strategic. I mean, there's a couple of things I just, you know, I have observed, I mean, even in prison, you know, it's like, you know, she's done a number of things in prison, like her hunger strikes, to bring so much attention to what's going on in the prisons, you know, so by creating attention on her, her stuff, it does so much more good. And so she finds ways to um, use everything and every opportunity to, to get out, you know, what, you know, to, to further, you know, attention on, on, on human rights. One of the things, uh, Nazreen, and to those of our friends who are watching today, I mean, it's, it's no ruse and, and happy new year. And, and uh, Nazreen was able to come home to uh, celebrate no ruse with her family. And we spoke to her this week and, you know, she's amazing. I, I, ama I mean, her sense of humor and that's, a, I mean, don't underestimate how much a sense of humor keeps you going because the two of them laugh, you know, they say jokes. I mean, they're very funny and, you know, obviously really in love with each other and support each other through this. But one of the things Nazreen said to us, which was really, really amazing, she's very aware of all these things we're doing. You know, Reza is able to speak with her. He keeps her informed. He, he tells her what's happening. You know, he's been able to be involved in different ways. And um, she told us that, you know, at night when she goes to sleep, she closes her eyes and she can imagine what these, what you know, these different events that we're doing and the things that are going on. And it gives her a lot of hope and, and it really kind of helps her get through. And, I, you know, we hope for that. But, um, and then she actually told us that. So um, that was, uh, that's part of it too. But I, I have really thought a lot about this you know, I've thought a lot about this and what I've really understand now, you know, when you have a purpose that strong, it, it becomes your guiding principle and it helps you often rise above very, very difficult situations that other people may not be able to endure. Your purpose and your belief in that purpose is greater than just the immediate, you know, thing that's happening. Mm, that's powerful. Purpose and will. Yeah, no, there is definitely, I would say, maybe uh, like a steely Gandhian, you know, Martin Luther King or uh, thing going on over there. And, uh, and she will be at some point recognized like the Iranian equivalent of Nelson Mandela, a person who goes and gladly will uh, 
pays the price, goes into prison, and, uh, and is quietly effective. And all of a sudden, boom, the world recognizes what a magnificent human being this person has been. And, and all of a sudden gets the, maybe gets the recognition. But I don't think that's what she's really motivated by. She is just knows her principles and she's sticking to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and she's willing to pay the cost. Uh, you know, thank you for her. She is doing the thing. She is more gutsy than I am. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely an admirable quality about her. Yeah. Um, Nariman, I think there's another question that came in. Um, so it says the U.S. is not without its social inequalities and struggles between gender disparities and the reckoning for racial inequality. Activists in the U.S. have our work cut out for us. What do you think activists in the U.S. protesting injustice and inequality can learn from Nasreen's story? Well, this is uh, the amazing phenomenon, at least from uh, what I am seeing from uh, what has been happening in the last year or so in this country. It's like the Black Lives Matter movement all of a sudden became a global movement. And even the Naxalites in India who have been uh, protesting the caste system in India are actually calling themselves BLM of India. So there is a, the, I, the difference between the national, the local and the global is getting blurred right now. And uh, what I think uh, probably we could uh, learn over here from people like Nasreen is the quality that I told, uh, 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 that I said about her, that sometimes it is just very important to be principled and be willing to pay your price and be quiet. Not everything has to be about tactical gains. Sometimes you just have to be able to lose tactically, but keep that moral high ground. And I think sometimes in, uh, in fight for economic justice in this country, uh, we lose the sight of keeping the moral high ground. I remember there were some uh, lootings in Chicago over the summer after the George Floyd incident murder. And some people from the BLM movement were out there justifying looting, that this is a part of reparation and this, I, we need to resist those facile kind of, uh, you know, uh, moral shortcuts. And we need to sometimes pay the short-term costs for our principles and call something wrong when it is wrong. And that's what we can learn from people like Nasri. Well, I'd like to add something else though, because, you know, when Jeff and I started making the film, it was, as you know, 2016, and there was an election in this country. And when I woke up the next day, I did not feel well physically. And I thought I had the flu until I started talking to other friends who said, no, I feel nauseous too. And why did we feel nauseous? Because I was in great fear of what's going to happen to our wealth in this country, our civil rights. And I think, I think what we can also learn, and I certainly watched this, you know, through the making of the film and what had gone on here for the last four years, our rights can be taken away very easily and we need to really pay attention to what's going on. We shouldn't, yes, we have it really better here than a lot of other countries, this is true, but also your rights can just be slowly, slowly, or like today in Georgia, you know, abruptly taken from you completely irrationally. That is the most disgusting thing, you know, trying to take people's votes. I mean, you know, look at what happens in Iran in the elections, right? You know, yeah, do they have elections? But they've already, you know, the high command over there has already decided who's going to win. And so we must learn, you know, that we should not be silent, you know, and that's what she says. Our children shall not inherit in silence. We should not be silent because our rights can go, I, I mean, like that. And I truly believe, you know, in the course of the last election that, you know, our courts and our judicial system, we did have, I, we did have a free and fair election and the courts and the judicial system held up under incredible duress and they could have crumbled at any minute and gone either way. In Iran, it's like, no, this is the outcome. We've pre-decided it. And we have to always be on guard because this is what happens in lots of societies. And, you know, for me doing the studies I've been doing, you know, about Iran and what happened and how this all happened over there, you know, imagine, you know, when the Ayatollah, you know, when he came back, 
I mean, people thought this was going to be the greatest free time. And look what happened. No, it was the end of the free time. Everything was taken from people, you know, and they believed that it was going to be different. And we, you know, so you really always, and that's sadly what happened in Nazi Germany too, you know, people just didn't like incrementally things happen. And so I think for me, it's about staying awake and, and not, you know, not ignoring, you know, what's around you and, you know, reading the tea leaves about what could happen to your rights. Yeah, that's fantastic. If I may just add something regarding what U.S. activists and protesters can learn from Nasrin. Nasrin um, Narman, you hit on an extremely critical point there. During the BML protests, during the looting and rioting, um, that was done under the auspices of the Black Lives Matter group. And unfortunately, um, it really, it did what I was alluding to earlier. The Black Lives Matter movement in that moment when there was rooting and um, looting and rioting and violence does not represent the black people who are fighting for justice and who are fighting for racial equality. And so it's so sad that we had individuals under the banner of Black Lives Matter, the movement, ruining the image and name of, of so many others who are nothing like that. And that's, I think, a, a lesson that, you know, violence is not the answer. You know, look at Nasreen, look at these women who are in Iran who are protesting. They're not, they're not looting stores. They're not doing that. They're not, they're not fighting that way. So you're absolutely correct. It's so important to raise your voices and to be heard and to stand up for your rights. But the moment there are people who are going to act out and try to claim the mantle of a certain movement and ruin it for everyone else, it has to be called out, it has to be condemned, and the differentiation has to be made that this does not represent our values. So that's, I think, the message that US protesters can take away um, and, and learn there that um, don't be afraid, continue to protest and stand up, but also don't also be afraid to call out people among you who may not be acting in, in a ways that are appropriate so that they don't ruin it for everyone else. Absolutely. And if I could just add on to that too, when it comes to this, I, I personally want to say this from a, a very personal perspective, somebody else paid and paved the way for you to be here and for you to do this. That's always been instilled in me. My dad always did that, said that. And you know what, to be honest, it was him and my mother that planted the seeds that allowed me to be where I am today. So for women, who, yes, our nation, America, has a lot of issues. There's wealth disparity, there's racism, there's inequalities, and that's going to happen everywhere. Sadly to say that's, you know, there's human nature and there's things that it just, it, it is what it is. We fight it. That's why we are given these voices. That's why we're given these platforms to fight for fight for justice, to fight for the truth, to, to fight for equality. Um, but equality is very different when it comes to comparing the United States where, you know, women can appear um, naked, completely naked, and that's empowering on, um, you know, national television awards. But at the same time in Iran, a woman uh, on a billboard is blacked out, um, like not even the face, but like the body, everything like the image is blacked out. And I've seen this in, in other um, Middle Eastern countries as well. Um, so, you know, comparing those two, let's let's take a look back and have that gratitude that somebody paved the way for us to be able to use our voices here. Um, and that's really where I, you know, I really feel is 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 really strong for me as a message is that we have our privilege let's use it to 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 make a global change right as nazarene says you know our children as i said you know we our children shall not inherit silence silence you know we are very privileged here and we need to do hold on to our privilege but and i also think you know to be role models for our children or our friends children or other generations because people learn that way i think you said it and i believe it you you know you, we plant the seeds in people and they flourish you know if they're exposed to people that are fighting you know for justice they will continue the fight and and, and remain you know really engaged and and value the freedoms you know we are so lucky here we're incredibly lucky here Mm -hmm. And we want to, in a peaceful way, hold on to those things and also further those things. 
And this is what we have to show. This is why we have to show this film in Congress and have this panel. <laughs> and watch yeah. I absolutely agree with that. And, uh, no, definitely this film is a gem that needs to uh, have a lot of people exposed to it. And uh, not only for Nasreen's cause, but also shifting the discourse on Iran uh, away from confrontation, away from regime change and military uh, confrontation and all that, and, and uh, bringing it on issues that matter and, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, highlighting these people who are underground and they're paying the price. And uh, those, these people, these unsung heroes need to be recognized. And uh, that's really the key thing that this film accomplishes. And I am so grateful to <laughs> Marsha and, uh, and her husband for having done this. It, it, it is amazing. It was really a delight to see that. Thank you so much. And, and I wanna say just thank again, thank you. So this has been an incredible conversation. I feel very privileged to have been part of it. And, and you know, I, I th for people who are watching, I really thank you for watching the film. If you haven't seen the film, I hope you'll go to the website. And, you know, I ask people, you know, one of the things I always say is, you know, thank you so for, for supporting Nazreen and the film. Because in what, you know, by watching the film and talking about the film and telling other people about the film, you really do further the cause of Nazreen. You, cre you create safety for her and others like her. Um, so I hope that if you haven't seen the film, you'll see it. And if not, and if you have, thank you and tell others about it. And again, I want to thank you again, Marsha, for, for making this film, for allowing us to share it. I know that we're um, streaming this on Facebook Live and there are over a thousand views on that as well. Um, and then we will be sharing, we will be creating a video clip, posting this on YouTube and also sharing it for people who may have missed it. So please check out the film. Um, it, we will be sending a newsletter out, nasreen.com, nasreenfilm.com. I believe. Oh, nasreenfilm.com. Yeah. Nasreenfilm.com. Um, Adele, I can't thank you enough for lending your voice, your um, your light, your your um, true, just genuine goodness, especially because of how much you care about making change happen um, for women and children. Um, I've personally seen your work and I know how much this means to you. Um, so thank you for sharing even your own story and your parents' stories, because that's very, very powerful. Um, Nariman, you're always, um, you're Mala's, you know, community builder. We, you're Mala. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be with, uh, with all of you sharing the platform. And I wish everyone a great Noru's uh, celebration, Noru's Piru's to everyone. And, uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, it will be a wonderful year of uh, freedom uh, making its progress in Iran and all other parts of the world. Uh, maybe come out of the pandemic uh, in, with good health and good, good conscience and, uh, and also may the world, uh, uh, you know, uh, blossom with freedom all over. Absolutely. And it's, this is, um, this is just a message again of gratitude because we have Ramadan coming up. Um, you, again, you can check us out at malanational.org. We will be having some tremendously amazing and impactful and meaningful programs for people all across the country right now, as we are still convening virtually. Um, I wish everybody health and safety and, uh, 2021 that is full of blessings. I know this has been a very, very difficult year for so many people. So again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. There's a lot of people that joined this webinar that have been watching, that watched the movie, that I have messaged and said, how can I support the film? So thank you so much again for, for your time and for your passion. Um, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you all.